Hello, my friends, and welcome to The Bible in Order, where we are chronologically going through the entire Bible in one year. Today's reading for September 17th is Daniel chapters 10 through 12. In chapter 10, we learn about spiritual warfare and the ministry of angels. Daniel prays. He sees a vision that grips him that he doesn't understand. For 21 days, he is humbling himself before God, fasting, denying himself, and seeking the truth. And when this angel appears to him, he says, For from the first day that you purposed to understand, Daniel, and to humble yourself before your God, your prayers were heard. Friends, there is tremendous power in the spirit realm when we humble ourselves before God. This being, this angel, says to him, I have come because of your prayers. The prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. It shows that there is a very real spiritual battle that is taking place. It shows us that there is a hierarchy of these spiritual beings that are unseen by the natural eye and that they are active, that they have jobs to do, and even that they have territorial assignments from a geographical perspective. The fact that there is this battle going on between the prince of the kingdom of Persia and this archangel who is delivering this message to Daniel gives me the impression that if Daniel had stopped seeking the answer at some point during that 21 days, perhaps the assignment of the angel would have been canceled and he would have been able to go and do some other thing. I wonder how many of us would pray for 21 days with humility like that, fasting, seeking God for the answer. They are messengers of God, but you can see here in chapter 10 that they are also ministers, or at least this one ministered to Daniel, and we can extrapolate. The one with the human appearance in verse 18 touched Daniel again and strengthened him. He said, Daniel, don't be afraid. You who are treasured, God views him as a treasure. The Bible teaches us that God views all of us as treasures, but he definitely shows a little more favor to those who humble themselves and seek him without abandon. The angel says, peace to you, be very strong. As he spoke to me, I was strengthened, Daniel said. The angels protect us. We read that in the Psalms. They strengthen us, and there is power in our prayers. When we pray, angels are dispatched with the answers. There's power in the multitude of prayer, for sure. In chapter 11, verse 1, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to strengthen and protect him. That is the angel speaking. So he protected and strengthened the king. And then we have this series of prophecies, and it tells us that it's specifically talking about Persia and Greece. Now, again, this is the year maybe 560, 550. It's definitely during the exile, sometime after 586. And because this is BC, the numbers are counting down towards zero. It's 550 plus years before Jesus comes on the scene. It's 300 plus years before Alexander the Great appears on the scene. And so Daniel is predicting and calling the nation by name that will succeed the Medo-Persian Empire. And after that, it's the Greek Empire under the lead of Alexander the Great. And there is such specificity as to the intramarital affairs between different leaders and the alliances between different countries, that there is absolutely no disputing what this is talking about, what nations these are talking about, even the individual people this is talking about. And again, this is another example, but the most famous example of how Daniel prophesied centuries before with such specificity that no one can deny who he was talking about or when. This all took place during the intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew. If you have a Catholic Bible, you can read First and Second Maccabees that describe some of these events. If you don't have a Catholic Bible, you can Google and read First and Second Maccabees if you'd like to read a history of some of these events. 
and it is astounding. And again, people who deny the scriptures can only say their only defense against the prophecy and the veracity of this prof prophecy is to say that it was written after the events took place. The problem with that is we have copies of Daniel's prophecy that date back before the prophecies took place. At least one historian has documented that this prophecy itself was showed to Alexander the Great during his conquest of the world at that time, and he literally hit his knees and prayed and gave homage to God. We transition into chapter 12. Now, nobody denies that Alexander the Great is the one leading Greece, prophesied in the beginning of chapter 11. Nobody questions that it's Antiochus Epiphanes in the latter paragraphs of chapter 11. But a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about what is happening in chapter 12. It's important for us to remember there are no chapter breaks in the original text. Those were added later to make it easier for us to find specific areas and verses. But if you read from chapter 11 into chapter 12, there's nothing in the text to indicate that there's a couple hundred or a couple thousand year gap inserted between these sentences. So when we read the Bible and we're trying to understand prophecy, we should be very careful. That last verse of chapter 11 says, He will pitch his royal tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountains, but he will meet his end with no one to help him. And nobody disputes that's talking about Antiochus. At chapter 12, it says, At that time, Michael, the great prince, some would call him the archangel, who stands watch over your people, will rise up. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since the nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book will escape. Many people would ascribe chapter 12 to this end time seven year period, this tribulation that is yet to come, that will be the end of the marker of days. Perhaps that could be, but I find it curious that there's nothing to give us a, a picture that there's this gap of hundreds or even thousands of years. It says, Many who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to eternal life and some to disgrace and eternal contempt. And so that gives us the picture that there is a resurrection, or this is the time of the resurrection. Perhaps this was literally a prophecy about Antiochus, and perhaps also it's this literal prophecy about a future coming one called the Antichrist, who is the man of lawlessness who is going to deceive the world and lead so many astray. The problem is, I don't see that in the scripture, any talk about this man of lawlessness, and we talked about it before. There's a spirit of lawlessness, and there's the flesh nature, the mankind that belongs to lawlessness, that is controlled by lawlessness. But the scriptures don't ever specifically say that there will be a man who is the Antichrist. There's the spirit of Antichrist. So let's not read into it more than what it says. I think that there's enough question about these verses that we should be resigned to say, I just don't know for sure, but my opinion is one thing or the other. Now, I am definitely not denying the fact that Jesus Christ is going to return. That is very clear in the scriptures. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 says, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and that the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, the people living at that time, believers specifically, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with him. That is the ushering in of the millennial reign of Christ, that last 1,000 years of human history. And so, friends, we do have that to look forward to. Jesus is returning. He will come back, and this time he will come back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The first time he came as a lamb to give his life. Next time he's coming as a king. The last thing we'll talk about today in chapter 12, this last paragraph, verse 9 go your way daniel the words of the the words are secret and sealed until the time of the end maybe we won't know until the time of the end many will be purified cleansed refined 
but the wicked will act wickedly. My friends, we Christians need to be focused on being purified, cleansed, and refined. And I'll just say briefly, if you're still struggling with the same exact sin in the same exact way that you were 10 years ago, or five years ago, or even one year ago, you've got work to do. This is not condemnation. This is saying we have work to do. He's coming for a pure bride without wrinkle, without spot, without blemish. And if we are blemished by our sin because of our inability to deny ourselves and choose the right thing, even more so if we're still so focused on the desire to sin because we are not growing, we are not being made into his image, we have a sincere problem. We need to focus on being purified, cleansed, and refined. And this is not just washing in the blood. I'm not talking about the forgiveness of sins that comes from the blood of Jesus. All believers, all true believers are forgiven of all of their sins, past, present, future. But if we are going to co-reign with Christ, we must also become holy as he is holy, not just forgiven, but sanctified. It takes work. It takes picking up the cross daily and following him. Character development takes hard work. So God is calling us, all of us, to get to work. Continuing in the second part of verse 10, none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. Do you understand what this verse is saying? That we need to be purified, cleansed, and refined? If you don't understand the need to be cleansed, purified, and refined, What category are you in? Verse 11, from the time the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1290 days. If the daily sacrifice was abolished in the year 586 BC when the temple was destroyed, the articles were ransacked and all of the priests were carried off into exile, 1290 days from then, if prophetic days are years, as most scholars would agree, then that takes us to the year 704 AD, and that is very close to the time that the current mosque that is on the Temple Mount, on the Rock of the Dome in Jerusalem, was dedicated not to God Yahweh, but to Allah, the God of Islam. Many people would say that is the abomination that causes desolation. And the scourge that is Islam has been raging against the Hebrew people since that time. Verse 12 says, Happy is the one who waits for and reaches 1,335 days. Well, from 704, if you add 1,335, that takes us to the year 2039. Does that mean Jesus is returning in 2039? That's not what I'm saying. I just find it very interesting. The truth is we don't know when Jesus will return. To some, he will come as a thief in the night, but not to us. Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour, but he also says you should know the season. Whether Jesus is coming in 2039, give or take 20 years, or another couple of hundred years from now, we don't know. But what we do know is that he's coming for a spotless bride without blemish, without wrinkle. He prayed for his people to be one as he and the Father are one. He told us that we would be known by our love for one another. And friends, the world looks at the church today and they don't know us by our love for one another. If Jesus were to come, Back today, he would find that the church is not unified and is certainly not spotless. It is certainly not without blemish and not without wrinkle. So it shows that we have work to do. May God bless you, friends. Thank you for being on this journey. Congratulations on finishing another great Old Testament book. We'll see you tomorrow.